All right, everybody, please note we are recording at this time. Okay, so uh, the first thing I'm going to do, let me go ahead and I'm going to share the screen. Uh, second of all, I am aware of the fact that I have not sent out the links yet for the um, uh, for the uh, for the videos for last week, and I apologize for that. I just noticed that uh, this morning. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to send an email out that's going to have a link to every single one of the emails for replay for all of this. So hopefully everybody will uh, will have a lot of stuff in order to be ready for this. Um, so here's the thing. When we stopped at the last uh, the last time that we stopped, we, we were talking about partnership formations and acquisitions. Uh, just to kind of go back over a couple slides that we looked at, you know, we were talking about, you know, um, computation of the initial basis, which is going to be kind of important. So I'm going to give you guys an example that we can follow in order to be able to um, uh, in order to be able to, to to kind of go to kind of visualize some of this. So the initial tax basis is required uh, to com you're required to compute the taxable gains and losses when they sell the partnership interest. But then there's also the partner's initial tax base when the partnership doesn't have any debt, blah, blah, blah. The reason why also we need to do the initial tax basis is, and it's more of a practical reason. I mean, they, they I know these, these slides always like to talk about the, the, the special and the, and, and, you know, all the fancy stuff that normally goes on. But really from a day-to-day -day perspective, knowing that initial tax basis can mean the difference between a taxable gain or a taxable loss. And so what ends up happening is there needs to be sort of this, um, the, the understanding of, 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 of how all this stuff works out. And so, you know, from a day-to-day -day basis, you, you really have to understand what the partnerships, the partner's basis is. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about S corporations, S corporations have the exact same sort of, um, uh, I mean, I, you know, basically has the same um, uh, sort of concept that goes on, you know, you have to know initial basis. There's a few differences and we'll kind of talk all about some of the differences that they have with S corps versus partnerships. But with, with partnerships, it's, it's really important because uh, what ends up happening is sometimes you can have a situation where somebody who has no basis that gets into the partnership, gets some losses or gets some distributions. And then we have to figure out what exactly is going to be the tax effect of those. Okay. So it, it is important to be able to calculate that initial tax basis. We will go over that with a problem. And, um, and it's the same problem that I've used in the past uh, that, that, you know, and, and it, it really kind of uh, illustrates all that. So, you know, and again, they say if you have it, if you have the computation of debt, initial tax basis when the partnership has debt, each partner must include their share of the partnership's debt and calculating tax base on their partnership interest. Outside base of the partnership, uh, partner uh, outside basis of partner contributing part, part property must also reflect partner's debt relief and any gain on the asset. What that basically is saying is, say for example, I I go ahead and I contribute a piece of land. Say it's uh, got a, an initial basis of two hundred fifty thousand dollars, but there's debt associated with it of a hundred thousand dollars. My initial basis that I'm going to have is going to be reduced by the debt that I have relieved. Now, if I contribute the land, but I go ahead and I maintain the debt, my basis still retains at that $250,000 level for the, I mean, the, my basis retains at the $250,000 level for that, for the contribution, because I've assumed that, because I have the debt. Now, if I give, if they give the part of the property to the partnership and I say, look, partnership, you take over this property, you're going to take my debt off me. That's going to re that's that gives me some sort of uh, relief from that debt, and as a result of which the tax consequence is I'm going to take my basis of two hundred fifty thousand dollars and reduce it by the hundred thousand dollars of debt relief that I received, and uh, and and like I said, we'll um, we'll we'll talk a little bit about this more uh, in a little bit. So you know they talk about that you can have recourse debt. Uh, a good example of recourse debt, you know, you, you start a business, you go out to the SBA, you borrow you know, $200,000 in order to start your business, um, you know, that, you know, if you have you and say two other partners, each of you is one third responsible for that debt. Um, and, and, you know, usually with the SBA, they're going to require that you have to be personally responsible for that debt. That's when you're going to see um, that you're going to have an economic risk of loss. Now, it's usually allocated partners who are ultimately responsible for paying it for it. 
So for example, you could have a situation where, um, and I've seen this happen before, uh, you, you, you start a partnership and say, we'll stick with that, the, the three member partnership. Um, one person's all money and the other two people actually know what the hell they're doing. And so what happens is that, you know, the two people who actually know what they're doing are going to actually run the business on a day-to-day -day basis. The person with all the money is sitting back, handing you money, and, and, and you're going to invest on it. Oftentimes what will happen is if the person who has all the money is there, the banks want that person to uh, have the recourse of all that. So it is entirely possible to have debt that is, con is considered non-recourse for two partners, but it's considered recourse to um to 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 the other people and so what ends up happening is generally what we do is we give all the debt basis to that one individual who has, bears the economic risk of loss uh the other partners basically will have non-recourse debt of it and then the at-risk limitations will pretty much prevent them from being able to get any benefit from that all right so it's allocated with all, all ultimate responsibility Allocate, so non-recourse is allocated according to profit loss ratio. Um, again, with the recourse debt, what we do is we give all of that debt basis to the individual who's got it. Uh, and then any debt that is considered non-recourse is allocated to a, on, a, on a profit sharing ratio. And again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of that when we do our example. Uh, partner contributing partner. Uh, yes, yeah, secured by debt. Re, okay, so... For example, I told you that I had an ex to illustrate point one. I contribute a piece of property with basis of two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Of that two hundred fifty thousand dollars, say instead of owing a hundred thousand dollars, maybe I owe three hundred thousand dollars. So I have two hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt I mean, of, of, of two hundred fifty thousand dollars in basis. I then, on top of that, have three hundred thousand dollars of debt. Uh, what will happen is there's a $50,000 difference. So my, my basis will be reduced to zero. You're never going to reduce basis below zero. But that extra $50,000 that ends up happening, there's a gain that's going to be recognized as a result of it. So the gain that's going to be recognized as a result of this whole transaction, $50,000 is going to be a capital gain, but it's also going to depend on, uh, you know, so it's all it, it's going to depend on, how long you've owned that asset. Now, obviously, if I'm if I'm upside down like that, I probably owned it for a long term, so it's going to be a long-term capital gain. Contributing partners holding period in a partnership depends on the type of property contributed. This is true. So if I um so if I contribute cash, the 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 date of when that um partnership interest takes effect is going to be um is going to be the date that i've de been determined to hold it so if i contribute cash say on may 1st my date for you know may 1st of 2020 my date of holding that partnership interest will be considered may 2020. now if i do contribute land and say i've owned the land for 15 years then my then what's going to happen is is that i'm going to have long-term capital gains or i'm going to have long-term uh ownership because i've owned it for more than a year in my partnership interest. And that's just because of the fact that what I've contributed was a long-term asset. I get long-term treatment as a result of that. Um, contributing partner's basis uh, carries over to the partnership, and that's absolutely true. Contribution of services. Um, so, and contribution of services, uh, you know, the capital interest represents current economic entitlement amenable to the measurement. So what this means in English, if partnership goes belly up, my capital account is going to determine who gets what's left over. All right. So if I give somebody a capital interest in the partnership, the IRS basically says, look, you are transferring economic assets to that individual. So a good example for that here and uh, I'll do this a little premature. I didn't set this part up yet, but I'm gonna put this here where we've done this. So for example, I have a partnership and we'll say me, and then we'll have you, okay? So uh, contribution. And actually let's do a total column here. 
So in total, we made a contribution of $200,000. And actually, let me go ahead and I'll beef that up a bit so that you guys can actually see it. Um, and so uh, total contribution of $200,000. I contribute nothing. All the money comes from you. Okay. So if we're talking about capital accounts, what would happen is in this case, the capital account for me would be zero. The capital account for you would be $200,000. That's pretty easy to understand under and see. But I come to you and say, wait a minute. I agreed to be a 50-50 partner. So I want 50% of the capital account. Well, what will end up happening is, is that the only way for this to take place is that you would have to give up $100,000 of your money, and then I would have to receive $100,000. So in order for that to happen, you know, we have... So the result would be this. So the ending capital account at contribution is then going to end up being 100000 split between the two of us. Now, the problem that the IRS has with this is what's happened? So if, if I did all of this and um, say I did all of this, uh, you know, we started on January 1st of 2020. We execute this on January 3rd of 2020, and by January 31st of 2020, the partnership goes belly up. I have a legal entitlement to 50% of all assets that's left over in the company as a result of this. So what the IRS says is that, look, if you're going to do this, you, you whoever has the, um, uh, you know, wh whoever has the uh, the receipt of this is going to basically be given $100,000 of ordinary income. I'll have to pay taxes on that, uh, and it's not just regular tax. You're not only going to pay income tax, you're also going to pay self-employment tax. And so as a result of that, um, you have it to where it's actually taxable to the individual involved. Okay. And so the partnerships, you know, and again, so what they've talked about here, we've done an actual economic, because what's what's happened here, folks, is, I have received economic benefit, and so and so I have to be taxed as a result of that. So the service partners, tax basis, and the capital interest, the ordinary amount of ordinary income he or she recognizes. Now, what will happen is if, if I do a profits interest, so if instead of that you come back to me and you say, wait a minute, Kevin, I talked to my CPA. He said this is a stupid idea. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a profits interest. Oops. And we'll do 50-50. Oops, and actually I screwed up on that one because I want. What exactly has transferred to me? Have I received anything yet? And the answer, the short answer is no. I've received nothing. All I've received is a promise of money in the future. So what happened is, is that there's no liquidation value when received. If the belly, if the partnership goes belly up in one month, like I just explained to you, you know, you still get your two hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff out. I still get my nothing out. There's nothing done, so the service partner will receive no income, and uh, non-service partners will receive no deductions from the issuance of the profit interest. Now, that's just the interest itself. That's not the actual allocation of profits at this point. Okay, and what I mean by that is. You know, to kind of go back, say we get, you know, we're going to start this on January 1st. You and I are sitting down at the table, and, and I say, I want a 50% profit interest. You say, okay, that's fine. Here's your 50% profit interest. I'll put all, you know, and you say, you'll put all the money in. You'll give me a 50% profit interest uh, in exchange for this. What really has taken place from an economic standpoint at that point in time is nothing. Absolutely nothing. In order for me to earn my 50% profit interest, I got to go out there and I got to work my keister off in order to do that. Now, some of you might say, wait a minute, that seems a little unfair to me, to Kevin Matthews, because Kevin's got to go work 100% and only get 50% of the interest. Well, that's not necessarily unfair because guess who put all the money in? You did. 
And that's a very fair thing to say, because if you think about it, without money, I can't do anything. But in your case, without me, you're not going to make any money. So that's why a 50-50% interest is seen as a, as a viable economic, um, uh, it is actually a transaction that has economic sustenance, which is required in order for, uh, for it to pass uh, the scrutiny of tax court, which is, um, which is, of course, something that's important. So tax basis of a purchase partnership interest. So if, 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 if you say, for example, there's the two of us and then you, you come to me and you say, Kevin, you know, uh, yeah, so we're going to start an accounting firm and you say, Kevin, um, yeah, I understand that you and I are very, you know, we're, we're smart when it comes to doing an accounting firm, but I got a nephew that is really good at computers. He wants to come in and work on the, on our computers, make sure our computers run well in exchange. We're going to give him a 10% interest in the business. Um, but what's going to happen is that you, you don't want him to get the 10% interest just because he's doing the work. You also want him to be able to part, part, purchase it. So we go to the person and we say, look, you, in order to buy into our partnership interest at 10%, we're going to ask you to put in $20,000. And so what happens is, um, the person who does that, he, they have the partner purchase price of $20,000 plus any debt allocated. We'll talk about that in a minute. And the holding period begins on the purchase date. And that's that's kind of how this works out. Okay. Organization startup and syndication costs. We kind of talked about this in the first half of the class. Um, costs must be capitalized rather than expenses. Um, so, you know, expenses include organization costs, syndication, and startup. And so, um, you know, you know, basically that ends up being the case. Uh, the difference between organization... Um, costs and startup costs this is you know and for the most part i think these tax rules really harp back to a time when it was more expensive to start a business than it is today i mean let's be honest you want to go ahead and start your own tax practice tomorrow you go get an llc you're in business you know i mean there's probably a few other things that you got to get done but for the most part it's not going to cost you very much money in order to start up um now, what will end up happening is, is that, you know, and that's talking like organization costs. Organization costs would be like me going out to the, um, uh, to the state of Virginia and saying, I need an LLC license. And they issue you out an LLC license. And as a result of that uh, LLC license, uh, you know, you pay 100 bucks for it. I mean, it's not like the good old days where if you wanted to start an organization like this, you better go out and go get like a limited partnership or some other kind of partnership uh, or a corporation, which could easily run to, you know, five to $10,000 of legal fees just to kind of get all that stuff set up. And, and it can be, it can be something that's very, very difficult to deal with. Um, uh, other types, you know, startup costs, on the other hand, are any costs that are required um, prior to opening the doors. So for example, uh, and we'll talk a little, we'll do an example where we start a McDonald's. Um, but, you know, all of the um, labor that you have to do prior to opening it up. So, you, you know, you build the building and that's all going to be added in the capitalization cost. But there's also going to be how much advertising do I have to do before I even show up? How much, um, uh, you know, how much, how many hours do I have to hire people for to train them, to get them ready to, uh, to, to work? from day one once the doors open. Um, so there's there's a huge amount of things that end up getting taken into to account here uh, that we need to, to, to look into in order to make sure that we're um, set right. So formation and, ac and ad acquisition of partnership interest, again, this is a good table that kind of explains a lot of the stuff that we've had um, and, and how it works out. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that because the, the examples, I think the example I have is going to be a much better one. Um, okay. So let's hold off for a second on, on election of periods. And we're going to talk instead about our example. So if you take a look here, what I've gone ahead and done here is that I'm, and I'm going to blow this up a bit more. Um, so for example, you're a CPA, you work at an accounting firm, and of course, uh, one of the misconceptions they have about accountants is that we're all rich. We have more money than we know what to do with. So, you know, fast forward 20 years into the future, um, 
you know, you've got a couple kids. Most of your kids are still, you know, maybe around 10, 15, you know, you know, between 10 and 15 years old. But you have this one niece from your older brother or sister, and she's phenomenally intelligent. And she comes to you and says, look, um, I've been working as a McDonald's manager now for a couple of years. Uh, I think we could own one of these and do very well with it. The niece comes to you and you absolutely adore this niece. And the niece says, look, I'd like to go ahead and start a McDonald's. And so you say, okay, what does it cost in order to start a McDonald's? I said, well, according to the franchise guys, it's going to run about $300,000. Uh, they want two hundred thousand dollars up front, and then they want then we then we can borrow the rest in order to get things set up. So the first thing that ends up happening is, and again, this is your favorite niece, and you're going to do anything for your favorite niece. Um, but more importantly, from that, you know that sh that, that that she's going to be pretty good at what she does. You, you you've talked to the manager of the McDonald's. You know she works really hard. Uh, he's very upset the loser, but you know completely understands. And of course, your niece wants to get out of their 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 town in the Midwest and get get into the big exciting life here in Washington D.C. And so, she, so you bring her out here. You guys are going to set up a McDonald's. We're going to do a 50-50 partnership again, because you give her 50% of the interest and the profits doesn't make any difference in terms of um, whether or not um, you know whether or not she's going to have a taxable event for that. Okay, capital contributed. You contribute two hundred thousand dollars. She contributes nothing. Um, so what ends up happening is there's a loan that then gets taken out for two hundred thousand dollars. It's a recourse loan. In order to get this loan, they require that each one of you has to has to take a fifty percent stake in the interest of that partnership. And so she takes a fifty percent interest. You take a fifty percent interest. Total basis at the beginning. Actually, I'll change this to beginning. Is three hundred is three hundred thousand dollars to you, hundred thousand dollars to her. Okay, does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions on that before I go forward? Nope. Okay. All right, so that, that's pretty easy to deal with. Now, a way we can kind of change this is, say, for example, instead of giving her a capital interest, you know, you decide to do a 50-50 because you want to be nice. You don't want to hurt your niece. You decide to give her $100,000. That's going to end up being compensation to your niece. And so luckily, as, you're, as, you're, as, as a tax expert, you know the not, not to do that. And so you're not going to actually offer that to her. Um, she may ask for it up front. Uh, but you have to explain to her from a tax perspective it's a bad idea, and here's why. Chances are she's not going to understand anything that you said, not because she's not smart, but just because most people don't understand tax. It is what it is. Um, sometimes you'll, you know, sometimes, you know, hopefully she hires a good CPA that's going to back her up and tell her the same thing. No, you don't want to do this because there's a bad tax hit if you do that. All right, so in year one, this is what happens. Okay. So in year one, now one thing that we've agreed, you're the money person. You are the person who, who supplies all the money. You're not going to work. You're not flipping burgers. You're not doing anything. So let me ask you a question. I'm just going to take a quick poll on this. Um, how many of you think this, uh, is this business active or passive to you? All right, I'm not seeing any responses, so I'm assuming that uh, passive. Okay, good, good, good. So, yeah, it's passive. It's passive to you. You don't go in. You don't flip burgers. You don't do anything. Okay, so this is for you in terms of this. This is a passive activity, and we'll just go ahead and we'll make a note of that. Okay, niece who's going in and flipping burgers every day, active or passive, it's going to be active to her. To her. Okay, so. Because she's going into flipping burgers, she's got to get money. She needs money in order to survive. Um, you're going to cut a deal with her that basically says, look, we're going to give you a salary of $40,000 a year. 
Um, and then you're going to have, you know, up to 50% of the profits as a, as an incentive for you, um, uh, you know, to participate in this, in this, um, in, in this scheme. So you've agreed to a $40,000 salary. Um, the first year you make $150,000. Remember in a business first year, you're generally going to lose money. That's typically a normal thing. Um, and you have expense of $300,000. So $190,000 in total, because you've got her salary and you've got business expenses minus revenue. It's going to be a $190,000 loss. You get $95,000 of loss. She gets $95,000 of loss. Now, let's go back. We, we, we talked about the three different levels of the what, what I call sort of the and I call these the th the other three buckets. Remember, I talked about active, passive, and portfolio as as a bucket. This is these are the these are the buckets for loss limitations. Okay, so loss limitation buckets you have, and I'm just just these. I, I'm sorry, I I thought I made these a little bigger. I'm gonna I'm gonna. Well, I don't know if I really wanted to do that. Z, actually, let's do this. See if I can get this done. All right, that makes more sense. All right, so these are going to be the three buckets for for you know the the so the first limitation that you have to get through is the basis limitation. Okay, so the basis limitation in this case you contributed two hundred thousand dollars. So you have so you have a limitation. So you've got three hundred thousand dollars in basis. She has a hundred thousand dollars in basis. Um. Can both of you take the loss as a result of the, um, can you pass through on the basis limitation? And the answer to this is, well, yes, you can, because she has $100,000 in basis because of the debt basis. And then the $300,000 in basis definitely qualifies you to have this loss. So you get to pass through the bucket basis. And you see there's this little little hole here. What what happens is it only allows certain things to go through it. So, so um this basically flows through, and then it goes to the at-risk limitations. Is there an at-risk limitation? Well, according to Code Section 465, it, you're limited to the amount of risk that you have in the business. Now, she has risk in the fact that, yeah, does she have risk? And the answer is, yes, she does because of the loss, you know, the loan. If, if this business goes belly up, she's out $100,000. So the IRS is going to basically say, yeah, she can take the loss. Now, let's pretend for a moment there that the SBA did not require her to take an interest in this loan, that they just came after you. And they said, hey, we're going to have you do it. So instead, we're going to have the $200,000 here, and we're going to have zero here. Now, does she pass the at-risk limitations? And the answer is no, she doesn't. She would not pass the at-risk limitations, and as a result of which, she would have an at-risk um, carryover of $95,000 until she has risk available, okay? Now, you personally, you would definitely pass the at-risk limitations because you're the one who's got all the risk here, and so you, you would actually be able to do that. I'm going to go ahead and change those back to what they were so, you know, that it is. So, so the answer is, did we pass the at-risk limitation? And the answer is, yes, we did. Now we have the passive limitation. Now let's assume this is the only passive activity that you're doing here. The question of the day is, do you pass the passive limitation? And the answer is no, you don't. Um, in this case, well, you know, we've gone back to the original example. So the niece has passed, she's passed the basis limitation, the at-risk limitation, and because she's active, she gets to pass the passive limitation. So she will have Effectively, on her tax return, a net loss of $95,000 she gets to put on her income tax return. Now, some of you might say, wait a minute. She doesn't have any income because she's only got $95,000. Well, you may have forgotten about this $40,000 that she has here that she has to take as income. So, on, on an overall basis, her tax return is going to be $40,000 of income minus $95,000 of income. So, she's going to have an overall loss. Darn it. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. So it's going to be an overall loss of $55,000. What will happen on her tax return is she takes the $55,000 and it will become a net operating loss. 
or sometimes we call those NOLs. Okay, so she'll have an NOL that carries forward to the following year. And, and, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about how that works out here. Now, for you, we told you this is going to be basis limitation, I'm sorry, passive limitation. You have to wait until you have enough uh, passive income in order to be able to take the loss. So we go from year one to year two. Oh, actually, before we go to year two, is there any other questions? Is everyone pretty much following this? Okay. So we go to year two, and lo and behold, we start making money. Okay. You're still getting your forty thousand dollars for your to your um to your daughter uh, to your niece for uh, for the work that she's doing. Total income for the whole activity was one hundred sixty thousand dollars. Eighty thousand goes to you. Eighty thousand. I'm sorry. Eighty thousand goes to your niece. Eighty thousand goes to you. And so what ends up happening here is this: you have a um. So you so you had a ninety five thousand dollar limited limitation last year, and she had an NOL carry forward of fifty five thousand dollars. Now, the fifty five, if I'm correct, and I and I'm, the new NOL limitation, I've actually been very lucky as a as a person. I haven't had to deal with the NOL limitations, but I think that they're limited to eighty percent of the um of, of you can only use them up to eighty percent, uh, if I'm correct. So what ends up happening here is this. Your niece has $40,000 of income and then also has $80,000 of income. So the way her tax return is going to look, she's got $40,000 of income she's going to have to pay taxes on. Then she's got $80,000 of partnership income that she's going to have to pay taxes on. And then she's got 80% of this loss limitation times point eight that she's allowed to take okay total income seventy six thousand dollars okay that's what that's how her income is now in your case you had eighty thousand dollars the passive loss limitation allows you to take up to you know it's either going to be yeah so you're going to have eighty thousand dollars of income and actually, let me back off on this. You have you have, don't have any guaranteed payments, and you're going to be able to take the minimum of either this or this. No, oh, whoops, sorry. So let me think about that for a minute. It's going to be max. Is going to be negative. Okay. So you can take up to the $95,000. And so what ends up happening is you're going to be like, okay, well, then it's going to get you to zero. That's what's going to happen on your tax return. Now, what will happen is, let's take, for example, instead of doing it that way, let's bring it up here. And so now you have this $15,000. But you're not going to get that full $15,000 as a negative income on your thing. This is going to be a passive limitation again. And this passive limitation carries forward every single year until you go, until you, know, you, you either exhaust this or you sell your, acti your interest in the activity. Um, so in your tax return situation, this business really hasn't affected you one way or the other. Um, at least not yet. Now, of course, you put in a whole bunch of money. Now it's starting to make money. Um, but what ends up happening is that you have this passive limitation that you're, um, that you're not able to do with that. Now, with regards to her income, this is $76,000. Now that $76,000 is not only taxed for regular tax, it's also going to be taxed for, for, um, self-employment tax because a partnership still has to pay a, a, a relative tax to that. Assuming that that's her entire tax return, uh, I would assume she's probably paying it at about 15%. Um, I don't have my book right around me right now, but uh, I would assume it's probably around 15%. And then after that, what we would end up doing is then there would be um, 
uh, you know, the 15.3% left over. So she's probably going to pay somewhere around, uh, you know, I'd probably say around 30% in taxes. So it's a pretty big hit. So the important part as a CPA, if you have a client that does a partnership like this, they have to do estimated tax payments. If they don't do estimated tax payments, they're going to get themselves into trouble. Uh, and it's and it's not a good thing to be involved in. Now, we kind of talked a little bit about how the tax effect of a lot of this stuff is. Um, we've talked about her, her loss limitations. But one thing that we did not talk about with regards to this is what would happen if in year one, I mean, we borrowed $100,000, $200,000, right? Do you think it's possible that that, um, whoops, sorry, uh, equals this divided by two. Um, do you think it's possible that that loan doesn't receive any payoff during that time? Probably not. Um, and let's say, for example, that it is paid off. What's going to end up happening is, is that any amount that's paid off could potentially, you know, so if it's, if it's just paid off and, and you have no um, income to speak of for this, there's not going to be too much to worry about here. Okay, so year one, when you have a loss and you pay, make payments on the loan, it's not going to be too much of an issue. The biggest issue that you're going to have is is if um, if some of the loss, you know, some of the um, basis limitations that you had is because of the loan. Now, in the case of you, you have $200,000 of ca contributed capital. You had a $95,000 loss. There's going to be no issues to you because the capital contributed is $200,000. Your loss is five ninety-five thousand dollars. Uh, the loss is less than the amount of capital that you contributed. But in the case of 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 your niece, this could actually become a bit of an issue. So, say for example, she had a loan payoff, and the loan payoff will say during this part of the year, we'll say it's a ten-year loan, and we're going to assume no interest. I know that's not reality, but just to kind of keep the math easy, you're going to have that happen. What's going to happen here, whoops, and actually, uh, we did 10 years, so we're going to say divided by two. And so, five, so um, we did a total loan payoff of $10,000. What's going to happen is you, you will have no effect on this because, like I said, your $95,000 is more than your um, $200,000. You're, you're good to go. Um, your niece, however, is going to have a bit of a problem here. And what's going to happen is that the IRS is going to look at this and say, look, your debt reduced because your debt basis went down. Um, you would have effectively had um, a potential uh, issue here. Now, in this case, because, and uh, let's see, so we're going to say that it went down. To, okay, so it went down from $100,000 down to $90,000. Okay, you had ninety five thousand dollars. What's going to happen is you're going to take this five thousand uh, dollars minus from you're going to take the ninety thousand dollars minus the ninety five thousand dollars for the five thousand dollars, and that's how much she's going to have to recognize as a long term uh, cap uh, distribution in excess of basis. Now, the distribution in excess of basis basically means she's receiving money when she doesn't have any legal or economic uh, right to it. So what happens is is that you've done a you've done a con, you've done a distribution to her in effect of doing this. Now now this this typically happens when you have loan payoffs. Now in her case because this is year 1 there probably wouldn't be any issues because in year 1 the, you know the beginning of the year balance would have been um you know uh would have been zero and then it would have gone to $90,000. She had $95,000 so this 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 uh $5,000 would probably be a um uh, would 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 actually be a holdover, but if this happened in year two or year three, we're definitely talking about um, you know distribution in excess of basis um, that would actually be taxed to her as a capital gain. In this case, because she's owned it for a year or more, it would be a long term capital gain. And I know that I probably didn't explain that as well as I normally would. Normally, when I'm in class, there's there's actually a better example that I can go over. But when I when I kind of try to build it on Excel, it, it it was just getting a little wonky. I didn't want to follow it too much. I thought I could talk my way through it, and I hope I I hope I didn't confuse it too much. We'll talk a little bit more about it as we uh, go through the course, because because it doesn't just affect here, but it also affects other areas too. 
So, so we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. Um, let's see. Are there any questions about this before we go back to election of overall accounting methods and everything of that nature? All right. So, so partnership tax, tax elections, accounting periods, and accounting methods. So here's what happens. When you form a partnership, one of the questions that you're going to have to ask yourselves, and of course, you're, and, and here's the thing, your clients are never going to ask this question, you know, because, you know, and I've said this in the past before, partnerships are a lot like marriage, very easy to get into, very difficult to get out of, okay? Um, and and if, I don't know, is there anybody in the class that's married? I can't remember. I don't, there is not, not <laughs> Victor, not me. Okay. <laughs> Victor's like, I'm still enjoying single life. Yeah. Uh, Patricia. Okay. So Patricia, I'm going to pick on you a little bit. Um, when you remember when you were getting married, uh, did you guys talk about prenuptial agreements? Um, things that might happen in terms of um, how we, how we, you know, if we get divorced, how we separate. Um, did you guys talk about, you know, division of assets? Absolutely not. Of course not. You two stared at each other in the eyes and said, this is going to be a, a perfect dream world and it's all going to work out. Well, I mean, that's probably not what you did. You're probably more practical than that. Um, but they're normally what ends up happening is with 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 marriage, um, you know, you're in love. You know, I mean, <laughs> who cares? Uh, a lot of people are going to, um, uh, you know, a lot of people are going to say, hey, look, we're in love. We'll figure it out. Look, if we don't have the answer today. We'll figure it out tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? We're in love. It's, it's the Hollywood um, uh, romanticism and everything of that nature. Nobody worries about the little details in this sense. Um, that's why they have us. It's our job to tell them, look, I want to congratulate you for doing this. And it's a very good example. Um, I actually have a client. Uh, he's been a client of mine now for four years. And he and three of his buddies decided, note to self, get a prenup for marriage. Yeah, well, I would say prenups are pretty important, especially in, in community property states. Again, this is not a law class. I'm not a lawyer. And I sure as heck did not sleep in a Holiday Inn Express last night. So I'm not going to be able to tell you whether or not, um, you know, what, what, any legal advice. But, yeah, I would probably definitely talk to somebody who has some common sense, um, you know. And, and, and of course, the, the first person who's going to think they have all the common sense is your parents, um, you know. But, uh, you know, they're good people to see out for advice, but sometimes they get a little overbearing. I get it. Anyways, going back to, uh, to, 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 to all this. But I have a client who came to me, and, and like I said, I've had this client for four years, and he said, hey, Kevin. Um, you know, and just to let you know, he got laid off from his job, um, not because of coronavirus, he got laid off from his job about a year ago. Okay. So a year ago, he, he, he got laid off. Um, he basically what he said, he said, look, I've been working my butt off for almost 40 years. I'm going to take a year off. I'm going to enjoy myself. Uh, he started a small dog walking business because he said there's like a whole bunch of um, you know, people that need their dogs walked while they're out at, out at the office. And so his job is to go in, walk the dogs. Um, he gets paid for it. In his opinion, it was great because he got great exercise. It was a win, win, win for everybody involved. Well, he comes to me and he says, yeah, I'm not really making a whole lot of money. I, I'm really happy I get to do it, but I want to get into something. I'm making money. So he and about two of his other friends decide that they're going to form a, um, a partnership um, and do, um, uh, rental properties. So they're going to, they're, they're not going to buy the rental properties. They just want to do the management of rental properties. And, um, all three of these individuals have experience in the rental uh, real estate business. So this, this is not, it's not like, you know, three guys drink a whole bunch of beer and decide, Hey, wait a minute, we can do this. You know, it's, it's not one of those things. Um, it, it's, it, it, it is, it is, you know, so they decide they're going to get together. They're going to form this business. And so he contacts me and he says, hey, Kevin, um, what do we need to know? Which is really good because, I mean, most of the time my clients, they don't do this. What they do is that they, they contact me on March 15th, nonetheless, and say, hey, oh, hey, by the way, three of us decided to form a business together. And, of course, March 15th, I chose that date specifically because that's when the partnership tax return would be due. 
Um, and, and we have about five different things that need to take place in order for us to be able to get the partnership set up correctly. And of course, in one day, it's not going to happen. Um, but he contacts me and he says, what do we need to do? So I give him this laundry list of things that need to happen. Sometimes it's good to have somebody rational outside of the relationship to be able to say, these are the things that we need to do. Now, the good news is um, we're, all, we're all affiliated with an organization that we all work with together. Um, so there's a lot of trust that all three partners have with me uh, just because of that. And so when I sat down with them and I said, look, these are the 10 things that you need to get done immediately just to get your partnership up and going. Um, these are just some things that you want to do. Um, the other thing that one of the other things that needs to happen again, we talked about this is an operating agreement. You need an operating agreement with the operating agreement. It's, and I, and I find it fascinating. Lena put out there that she would say, get a you know, note to self, get a prenup before marriage. Um, the, the version of the prenup for partnership rules is actually the, um, is the operating agreement. And basically what it does is that it lays out a whole bunch of things. One of the things it's going to lay out is who gets salaried and who does not get salaried. Who's the passive investor? Who's the active investors and things of that nature. Now the law is going to determine a lot of that stuff already, but there's going to be, this, this is where people can actually set down their intentions in the document because sometimes what happens is, you know, the IRS will have a set of tie-breaking rules that will happen when you're going to determine if somebody's active, passive, or whatever. And sometimes it gets down to what's your intention. Um, the operating agreement drafted by a good lawyer is going to answer that. So so that's actually a very good thing uh, to make sure that happens. But more importantly, another thing that's going to get talked about is there's going to be certain tax elections that are going to take place. The first thing and then the most important one is election of overall accounting method. Are we going to be a cash basis taxpayer or are we going to be an accrual basis taxpayer? Now, the law forces you to be an accrual basis taxpayer if you have uh, 10 million or more in uh, in revenues every year. Obviously, my friends who are going to go start their revenue or their rental business. They would love to have 10 million dollars in revenue. Probably not going to happen anytime soon. Um, so they could elect to do the cash basis if they want to. And I've, I've actually recommended them to do that. It, that way, you're only paying tax when you actually get cash involved. It's a good way to go. And then you have your, uh, you also have your election to expense a portion of the organization to startup costs. Uh, we talked about that in the past. You can actually elect to expense uh, immediately up to $5,000. Um, and then once you have an organization to startup costs over um, uh, $50,000, it starts to get phased out. You also may have the election to expense tangible personal property. That's where we talk about your set code section 179 in your code section 168K, even though 168K assumes you're going to do it automatically unless you elect out of it, um, that's that's where it ends up happening. And the reason why we do this is every one of these elections that we've talked about is what we call an entity-level ex- election. It's an entity-level election. And the entity-level election basically says, look, there's... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I knew a cough was coming and I just was fighting it. Um, there's an entity level election. Now, who gets to make the entity a level election? Well, generally, it's going to be the partnership as a whole, but somebody in the partnership is going to be elected to be the tax matters partner. And that also needs to be put out in your um in your uh, uh, in, in in your operating agreement because whoever is the tax matters partner, they're kind of like, you know, they have the power to do anything that's that's going to affect the partnership. And that's why everybody has to be in agreement on who that individual is. OK, so we want to make sure that that gets taken care of um, as, as soon as 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 possible within the operating agreement. Partnership does make most tax elections There's certain elections that are made at the partner level. And we'll talk about those later on. Counting methods. Oh, I'm sorry. It used to be $10 million. I guess now they've changed it to now it's 26 index for inflation. Um, and uh, or if you have corporate partners, if you have corporate partners, there's nothing you can do. You must elect accrual basis, um, which is which is kind of strange because I've had corporate uh, corporations that are elected on cash basis. Um, you know, you, you 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 could end up with with an issue here. Um, you know, where you kind of have to think about that. Now, some of you might say, well, wait a minute, why would a corporation own a partnership? 
and actually these happen very commonly. You would see these, uh, these are oftentimes called uh, joint ventures. So what'll happen is that you'll, you know, like I have beta solution CPA, which, you know, let's say that I do only tax work. And then I have another accounting firm that does only tax work, but both of us have been approached to do, um, uh, to do audits. And in order to do an audit in, in the state of Virginia, you have to have, you know, you have to have a quality control within your firm. So there has to be a partner that's going to be reviewing what the, what the audit partner is doing. Um, and so maybe I want him to review my work. I review his work. So we create a joint venture that's going to do all of the auditing work, uh, between our two firms. Um, that is a, a very common partnership that the two of us might have. Now, the good news about that is corporations don't pay self-employment tax, so there's no self-employment tax issue. It's actually a really good deal to have in, in that case. The bad news is you still have to prepare a partnership tax return. Uh, and so there could be some reasons why you would have corporate partners as members. So this is one of the issues that they run into with regards to um, why is it that there would be um, a, a concern for the election of the year? Most of the time what will happen, oh, they say, sorry, we're going back to cash method here. Um, most of the time what would happen here is, is uh, you're also going to elect in a, a fiscal year if you so choose to do so. Now, why is this important? Um, what ends up happening is, if you, say, for example, all of your partners are calendar year partners, and you decide to elect the tax year to end on January 31st for the partnership. What will happen is you will have an effective deferral of 11 months of income for an entire year. So what happens is, you know, partners year tax end and you you know, year one, year two, um, partners year end is, uh, or partnerships year end is 2-1 to 1231. They're not going to actually record this income until the following year. And as a result of which, you'll effectively have 11 months of deferral of income. The IRS is very concerned about this. Now, there's perfectly legitimate reasons why January 31st would make a perfect year end. Say, for example, you work in the real estate or I mean, the, the, in, the, in the retail business. <laughs> Most of your income is going to take place in, the, um, in December. I mean, that's why we have Black Friday. Black Friday is not called Black Friday for any other reason other than that's when they swap. That's when most retailers swap from. They swap from red to black. And so what ends up happening is when when they swap from red to black, that's usually when they're going to make most of their money. So if, if you have a certain amount of money that gets made within the, last, within the previous three months, you can elect that sort of a tax year. That's, so that's a perfectly legitimate reason to do it. And maybe they want an extra month in order to be able to prepare all their books, get everything kind of settled down, make sure returns are taken care of appropriately. Uh, one of the biggest problems that we have in the retail business is you buy Christmas gifts for all these people, and guess what? You buy them something either they've got 10 of already or they don't want. And so they want to go take it back, and they want to get the money, and then they go spend it on something else that they want. Um, maybe the retail business wants an extra month for all those returns to process before they close their books for the entire year. Perfectly legitimate reason why you would want to have a year of January 31st. But this is a concern that the IRS has is that you're deferring your income for 11 months and as a result of which um, you know, it can cause some issues. Between you, me, and the fly in the wall guys and the NSA agent who's listening to this recording, um, I'm going to tell you something. I actually think that if I had a client who told me that they wanted to elect on January 31st so they could defer 11 months, I probably wouldn't want them as a client. And that's not because they're doing something unethical. It's just that, I, you know, fiscal year uh, K-1s are probably one of the biggest hazards in preparing an individual's tax returns. Um, they're hard to maintain. They're hard to make, you know, make sure that everything gets done correctly. Um, and so you want to make sure you know, you don't lose those K-1s um, and, and things of that nature. So, you know, and you're talking 11 months of deferral. Not only are you talking 11 months of deferral, you have 11 months of opportunity for a K-1 to get deleted. Um, to me, it's just, it's it's a lot of risk. And, and usually I try, I try very hard to convince my clients, just go calendar year. It's not worth it. 
Um, you know, yeah, you could get 11 months of deferral of your income. I, I just, my personal opinion is, you know, make things easy on everyone. Um, you know, this is where we're trying to play a game that kind of fits. Now, if there's a legitimate business reason to be doing this, we do it. Um, and there's nothing to, to, to complain about there. So the steps to determine a partnership's year end, um, you know, again, uh, you know, so for the partnerships year end, it's actually done through these, through these different steps. Um, first, is there a majority interest year? Yes. So for example, we have three partners. Each one is a third. Is there a majority interest in this partnership? And the answer is no, because everyone's at one third. If I had one partner, say, for example, that's at 60%, and I have the other two partners at 20%, now I have a majority partnership interest. What's that majority partnership interest tax year? He's calendar year. There it is. That's my partnership, that's my partnership year in that case. Okay. If not, you're going to have this thing where you're going to do a, if not, do partners have the same year tax end? If yes, say they're all calendar year, the answer is use the partner's taxable year, calendar year, you're done. If not, say you have, you know, um, you know, I have one third, one third, one third, and I have one partner who has um, a calendar year end of, um, you know, say, um, and I'm trying to think. Yeah, so you have one calendar year end, January 31st, one that does, um, uh, uh, you know, we'll say February 28th. Actually, actually, that would be worse. Uh, March 31st, then we have another one that does June 30th. We're going to use the June 30th because it's going to be the least aggregate deferral. Now, what will end up happening is I, I made that kind of easy because each one's a third. There's actually a way that you're going to do this if you, if you have the, um, the, the partner's interest. To be honest, I've been doing this business for 20 years. I've only I've, I've I've only seen once where we had to sit down and calculate this out, and the partner did it for everyone. So it's going to be with somebody that's got a lot of experience with this already. Uh, I don't think it's something you need to worry about as a staff, and that's why I'm not going to make you guys um, calculate that out. Oh yeah, ordinary business income and loss. Um, so again, we and we've talked about this in the past. Um, Let's see if I can do this here real quick. So this is the, um, wow, this is really interesting. So the CARES Act relief, okay, well. All right, there we go. It's a, it's a, that's interesting. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, I'm going to open this up in Adobe. Actually, let's do that. All right. So this is, this is going to be kind of where we're looking at. Again, this is the, um, this is the partnership tax return. Now they've talked about this in the, um, with here where it says separate ordinary business income and separately stated items, separately stated items, change tax liabilities according to partners, unique circumstances. Uh, partnership ordinary losses is all partnership income exclusive separately stated items. So a good example of this is, you know, if, if I have, um, you know, gross receipts minus, sorry, uh, gross receipts minus cost of goods sold, uh, salaries, guaranteed payments, those are going to be what we would call ordinary necessary business expenses. They're all going to go on page one of the tax return. Uh, and I don't think anything here would be much of a surprise. If I pay taxes to the state and local authorities, it's going to go on to here. If I pay, um, you know, rent, it's going to go on to here. Other deductions and, and things of that nature. Now, some of you might say, what's, what are separately stated items? <laughs> it's going to be items that might have a different tax effect depending upon how they show up on the person's tax return. My favorite example is charitable contributions. Uh, where do charitable contributions go on a tax return? And they always go on Schedule A. So in order for me, as, so, so in order for the IRS to be able to track it and me as the tax preparer to be able to figure out that we've got everything done correctly, I'm going to go to the tax, I'm going to go to the K-1, which, you know, the K-1 is going to be, um, uh, let's see.
Form K1 is here. You notice how it said how how here there's this form there's contributions 13A. Right here you're going to have other deductions 13A. And if you go to the K, if you go to the K1 instructions 13A is cash contributions at 60%. So they say cash contributions 60%. That means that it's an organization that allows for up to a 60% of AGI deduction on it. Uh, so contributions are going to go here. And it's going to be that line 13 that's going to be able to, to, to be able to be put here because it goes on Schedule A. I need to be able to figure that out. Now, is that going to be, be a deduction for, um, for tax purposes for, for ordinary necessary business income? And the answer is no. I don't have to make a charitable contribution. It's kind of the whole idea of charitable contributions. I'm being charity. I'm trying to give charity. And as a result of which, it's a full election. So I don't have to do this. But if the business does it, there's a tax provision that allows for a deduction on it. Another example, Section 179, is that an ordinary necessary business expense? My answer would be yes. However, because it's an election and there's certain um, restrictions to 179, and as you guys know, in order for there to be a 179 deduction allowed, you have to have income. So say, for example, the partner does not have income. Um, you know, do I get to be able to take the deduction? And the answer is no. But if I come here, say, for example, this partnership here has no income. But say I'm one of those people who's invested in 15 different partnerships. Maybe the other partnerships have income that allow me to take the 179 deduction on my personal tax return. And that's one reason why we do this. The other thing is guaranteed payments. Guaranteed payments is basically the, the, um, the, the coin word for salary. Okay, when we talked about the nephew issue, we talked about, you know, that you were going to give, I'm sorry, not nephew, the niece, you're going to give them a salary of $40,000. The way this $40,000 gets reported is that it's going to go on box four here, for, for a for services. And then what will happen is when they get their, um, their K-1, they're going to have guaranteed payments for services, 4A, and it's going to go right here, $40,000. And so that's how that ends up showing up. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's see, another separately stated item. I've kind of beat the dead horse with this, but, you know, it's just some very common stuff. Foreign tax benefits. Uh, so if you pay foreign taxes, you're going to get those foreign tax credits to show up on your tax return. Uh, the other thing, of course, is distributions and marketable securities. The IRS does ask that you report this. More often than not, most of our most of our K ones we tend to remove it uh, because we just don't want to give the IRS any more information that they are required. Um, but it is something that you need to know in order to be able to calculate a person's losses or not. Okay, we talked about this. This uh, guarantee payments it's ordinary income received by them. Now, here's the thing: I I don't think it's very difficult for me to convince you. Hey, salaries are considered an ordinary necessary expense. Very normal. Um, but what else is considered? So say, for example, um, we pay for, um, you know, pay for a fringe benefit for you that uh, unfortunately is not deductible under the tax codes. That's where the guaranteed payments can also go in. So, for example, if I say I'm going to pay for your health insurance, but I'm not going to do it in a qualified way, we'll pay for your health insurance as a guaranteed payment to you. Uh, but you'll receive a on the flip side, you'll also receive a deduction for your uh, for the for the um, for the health insurance that you that you uh, actually get paid, so that's another way that you could have that done. Um, I'm going to stop here just because uh, self-employment tax kind of gets where where this stuff gets a little bit wonky, um, and it's and I've only got about well actually no I don't have any time left at all. Uh, again, guys, um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here real.